Hello, everybody, and welcome to CPFD's Getting Started with Virtual Reactor 23.0 webinar. My name is Sam Clark, and I'm the Barracuda Virtual Reactor Product Manager. I'll be your host for today's webinar, and CPFD's Matt Black will be our presenter. We're excited to have the opportunity to tell you about the new features and enhancements included in our version 23 release. This webinar is being recorded, uh, so if you missed anything or you want to share something you saw with a colleague or friend, uh, you'll be able to do that. The recording will be posted on our website's uh, webinars and presentations page, which is under the resources tab. Uh, we'll post it there within the next 48 hours, uh, so make sure you check back then to view the recording. Uh, we would like this webinar to be interactive, and we need your help to make that happen. Uh, as you think of questions, please put them into the question panel. We have intentionally allocated a significant amount of time to answer questions after the presentation. It will help us stay organized if you put the questions in as you think of them throughout the presentation instead of all at the end. Uh, for those of you joining us today who are new to CPFT software, let me briefly introduce our company. Here at CPFT Software, we are advancing multi-phase simulation and technology for fluid particle systems, primarily fluidized bed reactors. Our Barracuda Virtual Reactor software product models the 3D transient hydrodynamics, heat balance, and chemical reactions in industrial units. It is typically used to improve the reliability and performance of these systems through simulation. These are often industrial units that operate 24 seven for quite possibly years on end. For operating units, virtual reactor simulations allow you to look inside the system in a unique way, determine root causes of underperformance, and use virtual testing to reduce the risk of making any changes. And often, as you're looking at the software results, other ideas come to mind and additional optimization opportunities are identified. For those of you developing new technology, Barracuda is used to accelerate and broaden that R&D and then quickly commercialize, scale up, and communicate the unique capabilities of your technology to customers, partners, and others. Now let's get into the webinar itself. Our presenter today is Matt Black. Matt is a support engineer here at CPFD and has been with the company for two years as of this month. Uh, in that time, Matt has worked in a wide variety of roles with much of his focus being devoted to providing high quality support for our user base and conducting training classes for new users. In addition to this, Matt has worked extensively on the development team of Barracuda Virtual Reactor with the particular focus on the product's quality assurance infrastructure while also leading simulation efforts for multiple projects modeling industrial systems for clients. I'll turn it over to you now, Matt. Thanks for the introduction, Sam. And thank you to everyone who's joining us for the webinar today. The development team here at CPFD is proud to release Barracuda version 23.0, which has a number of great new features. If you're a Barracuda user, you should have received our e release email e earlier this morning. If you didn't, please let us know and we'll add you to our email list for release announcements. Version 23.0 is available for download on the CPFD support site, so if you haven't gotten it yet, I encourage you to log in to the support site to download it. You can find more details about all the things we'll cover today in the release guide chapter of the user manual, along with links to the full documentation sections in the manual. The major focuses of this release can really be broken down into two categories, one being further support uh, to further support Barracuda's capabilities for incompressible flow simulation by improving the software's ability to accurately capture vapor liquid solids or VLS flow. And the other major focus being refinement and improvement of the pre-existing capabilities within Barracuda, which should prove useful for users of all backgrounds. The first feature we're showing today, falling more so into the latter category, are updates and expansions to built-in drive models of Barracuda. As of version 23.0, four new frequently requested drive models have been added to Barracuda. The Tong drive model, based on the paper, a new drag correlation for fully resolved simulations of flow past monodispersed static arrays of spheres, published in 2015, the Tenetti drive model, based on the paper Drag Law for Monodisperse Gas Solid Systems Using Particle Resolved Direct Numerical Simulation of Flow Past Fixed Assemblies of Spheres, published in 2011. The Beatster drag model, from the paper Drag Force of Intermediate Reynolds Number Flow Past Mono and Bi-Disperse Arrays of Spheres, from 2007. 
and the Giddes bow drive model from the paper Hydrodynamics of Fluidization and Heat Transfer Supercomputer Modeling, published in 1986. A full description of all these drive models, along with references to the papers, can be found in our user manual. In addition to this, we have made an effort to better organize our built-in drive models. One way we have done this is to arrange the drive models in chronological order based on the publication date. In addition to this, we have labeled some of our lesser used drag models as legacy models, which will no longer appear by default in the drag model manager. These include the Hodder Levenspiel drive model, the Turton Levenspiel model, the Richardson Davidson Harrison model, the Stokes model, and the Constant drag model. All of the legacy models can still be accessed by checking the Show Legacy Drag Models option in the manager. Continuing on the subject of drive model updates, we have also made a change to how the Reynolds number is determined in Barracuda's drive force calculations. Previously, the interstitial velocity, which is the difference between the fluid velocity magnitude and the particle velocity magnitude, was used as the basis for the Reynolds number. But as of version 23.0, this quantity is now calculated based on the superficial velocity, which is the interstitial velocity scaled by the fluid volume fraction within a cell. Based on our internal testing, we found that the impact of this change on fluidization behavior was negligible for the tradition, traditional gas solid systems that Barracuda has been used for in the past. However, this update was found to be more significant for incompressible systems with liquid domains and gas bubbles. This is likely because the difference between the velocity of the fluid phase and the bubble phase tends to be larger in these systems compared to gas solid systems, causing the fluid volume fraction term to be more important. Project files created with older versions of Barracuda will maintain backwards compatibility when open with version 23.0. This is done by using legacy drag model definitions based on the interstitial velocity. If you wish to use the newer superficial velocity definition, edit the particle species definitions and choose the non-legacy versions of the drag models used in your project. Another change we're happy to announce for version 23.0 is the addition of temperature dependent densities for liquid and solid materials within your models. Previously, this feature was only available for gases since constant densities for other phases were a reasonable approximation within most gas solid systems. However, now that we are putting a bigger emphasis on incompressible flow systems, it made sense for us to extend this functionality to be universal among all materials since the temperature dependent nature of density can be impactful for systems with a large quantity of liquid materials. On the right, you can see an example of where this feature is useful even in a more conventional Barracuda simulation, an FCC riser. Particles in this simulation are being used to represent the liquid droplets of uncracked oil entering the riser through injection nozzles. As you can see, as the particles increase in temperature and evacuate and evaporate, the density and size of the droplets decrease with increasing temperature, as would be expected. The pre in previous versions of Barracuda, the dynamic droplet sizes were possible through our evaporation model, but the observed density gradient would not be. We would also like to highlight a quality of life improvement we've implemented for our secondary feeds editor. As of version 23.0, this, this interface has been totally redesigned to the more intuitive tab design that has already been applied to the other parts of the GUI, such as the pressure BC and flow BC definitions. We have also added tracers as an option to feed through a secondary feed bringing this feature more in line with the capabilities of other boundary condition options in Barracuda. A new data output option has been added to Barracuda, time average fluid velocity fluctuations. This new option can be selected for output in the average data, raw cell data, or data plane format. Since this quantity only has physical meaning as a time average quantity, it cannot be selected as a transient data output option. Time average fluid velocity fluctuations are a useful quantity for analysis in liquid systems containing bubbles. As you can see in the bubble column simulation shown to the right, systems with bubbles, bubble feeds, often experience an oscillatory bubble flow pattern as they rise through the system. This is, of course, this of course, causes the velocity of the fluid phase to display a similar wave-like pattern. Thanks to this new visualization output, this transient behavior can be visualized in a more constant manner to demonstrate where the crests of the waveform are occurring. The last new feature we'd like to cover today is the addition of a new utility script bundled with Barracuda, PID controller. As with all other scripts we bundle with Barracuda, 
This one can be found in the scripts folder of your Barracuda install directory. As the name suggests, PID controller enables you to apply a PID control scheme to your simulation. This allows you to dynamically control boundary conditions, including parameters such as flow rates or temperatures in an automated and dynamic manner as the Barracuda solver is running. The script is controlled through a command line interface in the Barracuda virtual reactor terminal and allows you to set the proportional, integral, and derivative control components, along with a variety of other options. Real-time updates of the values of the controlled variable, along with deviations from the set point for your measured variable, are shown in the terminal as the script runs. A support site post with a full rundown of the script and its usage can be found on the CPFD software website. On the right, you can see an example of the script being used in the gasifier training example system we, we include in our new user training. In this case, we are controlling the heat flux of the heating coil, highlighted in magenta in the geometry shown to the right, by manipulating the temperature of the heating coil. Uh, the graph shows the heat flux in green, rapidly approach and maintain the set point value, while the temperature of the coil in red continuously adjusts itself in response to the dynamic conditions of the systems. I'll now walk you through a quick demo where we go over these new features we just discussed, and I'll show you how this example we just talked about would be set up. So I'll go ahead and exit the presentation here, and I will go to the system that we have uh, pre-set up uh, for this demo. So like I was saying, this is the gas bar training example. You can see its geometry here in our grid generator. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to show off is that if we go, since we're in version 23.0, if we go to the drag model section, you can see uh, we've rearranged the drag models into chronological order, and we have all of the drag models here. Uh, for demonstration purposes, in this uh, example, we will actually be using the Beatstra drag model. So we can actually copy this if we want to, and letting us doing this lets us uh, take the Beatstra model and define it as a user-defined model, and that allows you to uh, go into this editor here and look at it. This is how it's defined. It's just like the old drag models. Um, this would match up with what's being shown in the user manual for the formulas used to calculate drag with the Beatster model. But we don't really need that in this case. I just wanted to show that off so I can delete that. And so if we go into particle species, you can see we have um, two uh, species defined for the gas fire here. We have the initial char in bed uh, caused from the combustion of coal. It has the Beatster model being applied to it. And same deal with the fresh coal feed uh, also has the Beatster model applied. <laughs> so I also wanted to show off uh, the tracers feature that we've included. So if we go into our cyclone pressure BCs, um, which are acting as the inlets for our cyclones here, if we go to our flux plane tab, we can see that output uh, tracer data has been selected as an output option for all of these pressure BCs. Um, so what this is going to do is anytime a tracer uh, passes this boundary, it will output a data point that will have various information about the tracer. I believe in this case it would just be residence time information. Um, but yeah, so that's allowing us to do that. So if we go to our secondary feeds, um, you can see we've defined one secondary feed uh, for this system. So if we go into here, we can see we've named the secondary feeds. This is also outputting raw tracer data. And as far as what we are feeding from this, we've only selected tracers. No fluid or particles will be fed through the secondary feed in this case. So you can see we've defined 100 tracers per second will be fed through the secondary feed and we've assigned it the species 2000 identifier. So that's an arbitrary number. You can define any number of different species to any number of tracers that you feed. That can be good for identifying what fluid is going where within the system because you can isolate them by species ID. So if we go into our BC connectors, in the gasifier, we are using this to connect the inlet of the cyclone to the diplet, dip leg outlet for each of the cyclones. And you can see we've only applied the secondary feed option to cyclone bc4 so what will happen with this setup is you have the pressure bc and overlapping with that essentially you have our secondary feed so whenever fluid enters uh the cyclone through this pressure bc and exit through the dip leg uh, any fluid that is exiting will have uh, tracers attached to it so you can measure the flow of tracers through the system through this method um, just for example in this case but you could do this you could easily imagine how you could do this with any number of different um, different applications. So that's all I wanted to show off in the project file itself for this. So next I'll go to the run tab and I will briefly show off the uh, capabilities of our PID controller. So we are in the uh, Barracuda virtual reactor terminal here. 
So if I do PID underscore controller, and then I do dash H, that'll show us the help command. I can briefly go through uh, what these different flags mean here. Dash H obviously shows the help uh, menu, which we're looking at now. Uh, we have dash P, which is going to act as the proportional controller gain value. Uh, dash I, which is going to act as the inter integral controller gain. Uh, dash D, which will act as the derivative controller gain. Uh, dash R is the ramp time. So what this does is when you change your controlled variable, uh, this is how long a period of time that change will be applied. So you can make it very, very quick, or you can make it more of a steady change over time. Uh, dash S is what we call the sleep time. Uh, this is the number of real-time seconds that the uh, script waits before it rechecks uh, deviations from the set point and then redoes the error calculation to determine what the um, controller should be set to. Uh, dash F is your measure file. So this is the, you're assigning a file that is showing your output data. Um, and this is basically the, the thing that you are setting your set point to. And then you have the dash lowercase c, which is the column within your measure file that is a particular variable that you are measuring to reach that set point. And then dash t measure target is essentially your set point. Uh, dash capital F is the controlled file. So this is the file that you are manipulating um, the uh, value of to achieve your set point for your measured uh, data. Then you have dash capital C. That's going to be the column within your control file that you are actually manipulating. Dash N is going to be, you can assign a minimum value to your controlled variable just to keep it within the bounds of reason. So the controller will not bring it any lower than that. And then dash X is control max, obviously the same, but in a different direction. It won't go any higher than that. And those other two are just for debugging, not especially important. So what's happening in this is we are going to be manipulating the temperature of our heating coil to um, control the heat flux of the heat of the that the coil is outputting. So if we look in here, just as an example, in our thermal wall DCs, we click into this one and we go to edit. So this is the what we're going to be controlling. So what's going to happen here is we have we're going to be starting at time equals zero at 1300 Kelvin. Um, in real time, this file will continually get updated and reread by the solver to adjust to the new temperature values that we need to adjust to based on what it should be, you know, based on our deviation from our set point. So I will go back to the run tab and then I will open up uh, this terminal again and I will begin uh, typing in our actual controller command here. So we're gonna set the proportional gain to be 0 0.001. We're gonna set the integral gain to be 0 0.005. Oops, 0 0.005. Uh, we're not gonna have a derivative gain in this case, so we're gonna set that to zero. So it's gonna be PI control only. Uh, dash S, we will do 10 seconds of sleep time. So it'll wait 10 seconds per iteration. Uh, dash R is gonna be point, point oh 0.02. So this is a very fast ramp time. So we're kind of approximating step changes here. It'll, the change will take place almost immediately in the context of the system. Uh, dash F is going to be uh, trans.data01. So this is the transient data file that contains the heat flux output for the coil. And then in column nine, that is the uh, variable that we are going to be measuring to reach our set point, which is going to be a heat flux of 5,000 uh, watts per square meter. And then we have our dash capital F, that is the one we just looked at, BC underscore, underscore heating underscore coil dot SFF. So that's going to be controlling the temperature of the heating coil. The column within that is obviously column two. And then we're starting at 1300. So we're going to set our minimum as 1200 and our maximum as 1400. Obviously a lot of uh, text there. I don't think I did any typos, but if so, we'll know pretty quickly, but I think that's good. Just doing a quick double check here. Uh, yep, that all looks good to me. So I'll leave this. I won't start running this until we've actually started the simulation. And so now I can go ahead and start running it. So I'm gonna click run solver, uh, we'll remove anything that was already there. We'll see one GPU for the purposes here. And now we have got our solver going. It's gonna briefly do some setup here initializing the particles and such. And once that's ready to go, I'll go ahead and start this as well, but I'm gonna wait till it actually starts. Okay. And so now you can see, uh, this is the first iteration of it. So it gives you the real time at which it did the read. It gives you the simulation time at which it started. 
and then it's showing the measured variable. It's at 1.8 right now, obviously a big difference from 5,000 because it just started. So we're doing a big change on our controlled variable here. So it's going from 1300 Kelvin immediately to 1305. And then we had one more. This time we went to 700-ish uh, watts per square meter. So a big change there as well. Still, still crawling up our temperature there, but then you can see we also have the proportional and integral components changing as well. So all of this will be basically updated every 10 seconds with whatever it's been changed to. And just for demonstration, we can see if we go back to this thermal wall DC SFF file and we click edit, we obviously don't want to edit it as it's running in real time, but you can see it's already um, showing these new values. So it goes 1300 to 1305, 1305 to 1306, and then the latest one went from 1306 to 1308. So that'll change in real time. Um, okay, so obviously uh, that's going to take a little while before it runs out to a point where we have shown uh, really meaningful changes and meaningful results. So we are going to put this in the background and let it run on its own for a little while. And meanwhile, while that is going, we are going to go to our riser uh, example here. So <clears throat> this is also one of our training examples. This is the riser in this case is one of our optional trainings. Um, and so what we're going to be showing off in this case is kind of our um, uh, some of the other features in 23.0, including uh, variable densities for certain materials. So if we look here, very basic geometry, just a very simple riser. And so now we can go to our base materials tab here. And so you can see we have various solids, you know, catalyst, coke, and then we have gases. Obviously, these are going to be the, the cracked components and also steam and such. We also have gas oil, which is going to be our, you know, uncracked uh, feed into the system. It's going to be fed as a liquid droplet. So it's been defined as a liquid vapor, which if you're not familiar, means it can uh, come in as a liquid and then evaporate into the vapor phase and join the Eulerian. So it can start on the Lagrangian, join the Eulerian, which is kind of a unique thing in Barracuda. Um, and so if we look in the past, the liquid phase would have just been a constant value here. Uh, but now it's showing the edit expression button, just like it would have in the past. So if we go to edit expression, we can see um, oops. we can see we have defined um, our temperature as an SFF file. So we are uh, putting the, the units in in degrees Celsius and they're coming out as uh, kilograms per cubic meter. So if we edit this file, we can see it's just a really simple uh, input in this case. So we're saying at 50 degrees C, the gas oil liquid has a density of 950 kilograms per cubic meter and up to 300 uh, degrees C, it goes down to 780. And then with tech line integration, we can do a quick look at this graph. It'll be a uh, very simple, of course, it's a straight line uh, because that's good enough in this case. But obviously, um, if you wanted to, you could define this as a fourth order, up to fourth order polynomial or a double polynomial based on some kind of split point. In this case, you just kept it very simple, but really the sky's the limit as far as complexity goes here. You can make this, you can make this a density relationship as complex as you could possibly need to for either a liquid or a solid. Um, in this case, we are keeping our solids as uh, constants. So if we go into the cat base, you can see we still have the edit expression option, but it's only ever gonna return uh, 1620 kilograms per cubic meter. And this is how it would work for backwards compatibility as well. So if you open up an old version where you defined a constant density for something, it wouldn't show it as a text box, it would show it in this fourth order polynomial uh, style. So anyway, enough about that. Uh, the only other thing that's worth showing here as far as features for version 23.0 is once again, if we go to drag models, you can see they're all here. In this case, we have defined this using the Tong drag model, so 2015. Um, so if we go to our particle species, you can see, just like I was saying, the heavy gas droplets that are going to be injected are going to be in the Eulerian phase at, or in the Lagrangian phase at first. So of course, they're going to need a drag model to define how they'll uh, you know, flow within the system. So we have our FCC catalyst with the um, uh, Tong drive model already being applied to it. And same with our droplets as they enter the system. We have the Tong drive model being applied there as well. So for the purposes, we've already pre-run this one. Uh, uh, purposes of demoing it, we've pre-run it. And so if we go to view results here, we can open up TechPlot and we can see in the default view, we've got our particle volume fraction, a bunch of catalysts flowing, kind of dense towards the bottom, then gets very dilute towards the top. Um, but I what I really wanted to show off here was if we go to open layout, uh, we've already kind of got the uh, graphics for showing this off for the purposes of the webinar uh, pulled up here. And so we'll give that just a second to load in. And so you can see what we've got is we have the catalyst kind of um, 
displayed in more of a brown color here. And then we have our liquid droplets being colored by certain variables. And this will look familiar if you're paying attention to the webinar. It's basically the same graphic. But um, yeah, you can see we have liquid droplets entering at a very or a relatively low temperature, and then they rapidly increase as they you know enter this very hot riser. Um, and then across that same gradient, you can see that we have our liquid droplets rapidly decreasing in density, starting relatively high at around maybe 850 or so, and then dropping down to about 780. And then same with the uh, liquid uh, droplet size in microns here. You can see they're starting out relatively large, and they get smaller over time. You can also tell that we that one thing that's nice about TechBlot is for visualization purposes, you can actually have the droplets um, change relative to their size, which is a really nice feature. So if we zoom in a little bit more here, yeah, we can see that as they evaporate, they really are getting quite small compared to how large they are at first, uh, at least for the droplet size look um, that's been applied. So that's a pretty nice feature. But really, that's all that I wanted to show here, just the fact that this is possible with solids or liquids. Um, like I said, it's applicable in a more traditional um, barracuda simulation like the one being shown here. But it can also be shown for, or it can all, it's much more readily applicable in an incompressible uh, simulation sort of environment. So that's very exciting for people who are concerned with those sorts of systems. Um, okay, so we can actually go back to the gasifier now that we've given it a little bit more time to run out. Let's see. So it looks like it's gotten out to about 1.8 seconds, which is obviously still not too far, but it's hopefully enough at this point that we can at least start to see trends uh, that are approaching what we would um, hope for it to be. So if we go to our setup, or I'm sorry, not view setup, uh, I just wanted to launch TechPlot, so we'll need you to post run. And then we're just gonna launch TechPlot on its own. And if we go to load Barracuda data, we can load in both of the relevant data files uh, for this. So first we'll load in our transient data file, which is gonna have our heat flux data. And then we will also load in our, our BC heating coil.sff, which is obviously going to have our heating coil uh, data. And so I've already uh, saved a, a style for this so we can easily get a view of this. Um, so if we do a control F. Okay, so now we've auto sized this to the appropriate bounds. As you can see, zero to two seconds. So in the green here is our heat flux uh, represented on the left axis here. And on the right is our coil temperature represented on the right axis. And so if you were to use this, this is roughly what you would expect, right? You've got the temperature kind of increasing in this stepwise, stepwise function, and then it stays constant until the next read, and then it changes again in response to the uh, conditions of the PID controller. And so we can see we've kind of got this step pattern uh, following the temperature increasing the, the the heat flux is going down, then going up, then going down. But we can see it's very quickly approaching that 5,000 uh, watts per square meter set point that we would expect. It would probably get there in another second or so and then start kind of oscillating around that. Uh, but we don't have to guess too much because we've also run this one out for 100 seconds already as a, as a pre-run. So we can actually compare against a full uh, run of this. So if we go to our completed uh, gasifier example, and then we go to our transient data 01. And then we also load in our heating coil SFF. And now we'll apply that exact same style sheet to this. Oh, oops, I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Um, I actually loaded in the wrong transient data file um, or the wrong uh, BC heating coil. I wrote in the one from the incomplete run. So I'll be very careful this time. I will load in the transient data file once again. And now I will load in the BC heating coil from the done uh, once again. Okay, now we can apply that style sheet. And we'll see, okay, yeah, we'll see this sort of pattern. So zoomed out very much, you can't really tell it's stepwise uh, for the temperature at least because it's over this long of a period of time. It's uh, in this far out, it's not super obvious. So we can see what's happening here. If we look at the very early parts of it, we're seeing basically what we started with, which is we're starting at you know 1300 temperature wise rapidly increasing for the first five seconds or so. We can see at first we overshoot our uh, set point by a little bit, which would be ex expected to some extent for a controller. And then we basically for the rest of the run, we start to oscillate around that set point, which would also be fully expected. We're hitting it pretty close for the most part, never more than maybe a thousand off, only briefly at that, um, which is totally expected for a system as turbulent and um, kind of prone to noise as a uh, two-phase flow system like a gasifier would be, right? All those particles around, gonna cause variations in what 
uh, what temperature needs to be put out for the heat flux to maintain that exact 5,000 watts per square meter um, uh, output. So you can see it, it saves that set point pretty well, and we also see the temperature uh, adjust pretty dynamically and maybe slightly unexpected ways. The further we get in, the closer it gets back down to that 1300 original value. But yeah, this is the kind of thing you would expect. Obviously, this is going to lead to a very large um, SFF file. But yeah, that's um, that's actually all I wanted to show on the demo side, which means that we can get uh, back into the presentation. So I will go ahead and go back to this. I will restart here. And so we've actually covered all the new features in Barracuda version 23.0 that we're going to talk about today. So now is a great time to submit your questions. Uh, we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, so be, so be sure to get your questions into the question panel. Uh, for those that are new to CPFT software, I want to briefly let you know a few different ways you can get started working with us. Software licensing is the first method where your team uses uh, Barracuda directly to set up, run, and post-process simulations. We have a number of different licensing options available, so please contact our sales team for specifics. Global teams can take advantage of our global enterprise license option available in most countries, and virtual reactor licenses can be served either on-premise or on the cloud, which opens the door to using both your own hardware and cloud computing resources. If you're a Barracuda user who would like to add license tokens, license tokens to your RLM server in order to run more simulations or take advantage of the speed of multi-GPU processing, please contact our sales team. It's easy to add solver, chemistry, and or uh, GPU tokens at any time to meet your needs. We also offer engineering services for those of you with a one-off or urgent need or if you'd like to gain the engineering benefits of modeling your system with virtual reactor prior to building out a team to run the software, please contact us if you want to learn more about this option. The easiest way to get started is with our training classes. Our next class is coming up in about a month. More information on that in, in a few slides. Uh, training can be combined with project work and licensing in what we call our quick start program which is intended to get you up and running as quickly, as quickly as possible. We run the first models for you with our engineering services team. Then we hand the models over to you, train you on the software, and provide the software licensing. This allows you to build out your own in-house capabilities with models that are already up and running. Lastly, we work with people in a variety of custom ways through various R&D partnerships, ranging from fluidization research to researching new physics models, to technology development. R&D partnerships can be direct with us or collaborative with our strategic partners. Contact us if you are interested in becoming a partner. We have some upcoming events that we'd like to highlight. Uh, PSRI is having their TAC annual meeting in Chicago on June 19th through the 21st. Staff from CPFD will be attending that meeting in person. So if you'll also be attending and you'd like to schedule a meeting with us, please contact us and we'd be happy to do that to talk about anything that you would want to talk about related to Barracuda. Uh, the AMI Chemical Recycling Conference will be taking place in Frankfurt, Germany on June 26th through the 28th. AIX Process, our Barracuda virtual reactor distributor in Germany, will be attending that conference. If you'll be there, we encourage you to meet with the AIX team and learn more about how virtual reactor is being used in the chemical recycling industry. Uh, finally, if you are interested in attending a web-based Barracuda training class, we have two coming up in the near future. The first will be July 10th through the 14th, and we still have some space available in that class, so please contact us if you'd like to attend and get some hands-on experience using Virtual Reactor. If the July class doesn't work for you, we'll be having our next class on August 21st through the 25th. These classes are a great, great way to learn about Barracuda in depth. Check out our events calendar for more details on these and many other upcoming events. And you have an upcoming event that you'd like us to put in our calendar. Please send us your information. All right, now we are ready for questions. Be sure to add your questions to the box if you haven't already. Um, all right, and I think Sam has been uh, looking out for questions that have come in throughout the conference here, so or throughout the webinar. So uh, Sam, if you want to go ahead and uh, read off a few, we can maybe start answering them. Sure. Uh, thanks, man. I'll let you catch your breath there. A few questions have come in. So uh, let's take uh, one of these first. Uh, one question is, 
how do I know if my drag models from older projects are okay? And the I think the context of this is, you know, we've done these drag model updates uh, in an effort to improve things, uh, make it more consistent with, with kind of um, a lot of published papers and things like that. Um, so how do users know if they should switch from their old drag model to one of the new drag models or, or if their older projects would be fine? So Matt, maybe you can speak to that one. Yeah, I can. And we did briefly discuss this in the presentation itself. Like I said, in our own internal testing, uh, we did, and we tested over a range of different uh, gas solid systems uh, internally before releasing this, of course. And we didn't see any significant change in the context of, you know, gas solids, like we were saying. Um, however, obviously, we can't guarantee that that would apply to every single system that anyone could possibly run with Barracuda. Uh, so I would say if you have a big concern with that, I would definitely recommend maybe comparing your base case results using an old version, you know, 22.1, which would have still been using the interstitial velocity basis for Reynolds number. Compare that, run it, run the exact same process again on 23.0 uh, with the, um, with the uh, what's it called, superficial velocity basis. And just kind of, kind of see if your major, you know, KPIs are changing or if anything of significant note is changing on either a qualitative or quantitative basis. Um, obviously, you're going to want to compare with data wherever possible. Some some good data that might be good to compare would be, you know, pressure drop in the bed would be a good KPI. And then entrainment rate through your cyclones would be another one that would be a, a, a reasonably a good, good step to checking those. Um, and it, a calibration could potentially be needed in those cases. Um, and switching from an, an older to a newer model uh, for a variety of reasons, including this, uh, could require adjustment of the calibration parameters you've used for a real operating system. But overall, um, yeah, we, we don't have any strong reason to, to suggest that anyone needs to have any concerns about uh, the transition here for how our drag is calculated. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, another question that came in is, uh, can the software simulate a downer unit uh, kind of like the riser that we showed, where, but that one had uh, upward flowing gas. Uh, can Barracuda be used to model systems where the particles in the gas are flowing in the downward direction? Yeah, I can I can take that one as well, Sam. Okay. Um, and I, I do have it on good authority that downers have been simulated in Barracuda before with success. Um, I can't speak specifically to the challenges, but there definitely are challenges associated with downers that you wouldn't see in a riser. I think the really low resonance times and the really high velocities can make the simulations run uh, slower than a, than a normal Barracuda simulation. So you may need a pretty beefing machine to run it in a, at a decent rate. Um, I think kinetics can also be a bit of an issue just because it's such a small amount of time that the catalyst is contacting, um, but there can be some challenges there. So I can't speak to it uh, in too much specifics, but I do know that downers have been simulated in Barracuda. So there's, there's nothing keeping you from simulating it. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, uh, another question that came in is um, about the PID controller feature. Is it possible to model flap valves uh, such as a wall converting to an opening? And so I think this question is like for a cyclone dip leg, the exit from the from the bottom of the dip leg. Can you kind of make that into a flap valve sort of PC? Okay, and you may want to jump in on this one too, Sam, but my initial thought for how this could be done, I've never done this, but I would imagine you could just uh, throttle the outflow rate of the flow BC, um, or, well, actually, it might be kind of tough. I guess we don't have an SFF that lets you control BC connector data. I don't know, Sam, do you have any immediate thoughts on how you could do this? The, yeah, the, the thought that comes to mind here is... Um... To do this, I'm not sure I would use the PID controller because as, as Matt mentioned, is a lot of times for these cyclones, we're using BC connectors and those are really controlling the flow rate of the particles, they're controlling the flow rate of the fluids. Um, however, the BC connector itself does have an input that uh, can enable or disable the particle flow based on a mass threshold. And, and this is a feature that I haven't personally used a whole lot, but it, it is there to, to say, okay, I need to build up 10 kilograms of particles and then I'll open and then I'll build up 10 more and then I'll open. So I, I think just the native behavior of the BC connectors is, is probably the better way to approach that rather than trying to use uh, the controller script. Okay. Yeah, that's great to know. I'd never used that before. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, 
it's it's there, but a lot of times we just tend to let the particles flow directly back into the bed. Um, and, and usually for the time scale of, of a typical Barracuda simulation, that's not a bad approximation. Um, okay, uh, let me see. Uh, let's get a couple more questions if we can. And, and if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to put them in. Um, one thing that I think was was maybe briefly mentioned on one of the slides was how uh, passive scalars have been removed in this release. Um, and it's kind of related to to a few other things that you talked about, Matt, was kind of how we, we've improved tracers um, for this. But if someone was using passive scalars in their project previously to calculate fluid residence time, what should they do now? Right, yeah, and that's um, that's kind of the intention for why we removed passive scalars in the first place, is the idea that now that we have improved the capability of tracers and also the usability of it on the GUI side setting it up, um, the idea is that anything you could do with passive scalars in the past, you can now do with tracers in a more intuitive manner. So the, so the recommendation there would basically be um, use, use tracers instead for basically anything you would have used passive scalars for in the past. Um, use tracer and then analyze the tracer data at flux planes and such and just make sure to enable uh, tracer output data for those flux planes and that way you would be able to calculate the fluid residence time because the the tracer is essentially holding on to one parcel of fluid uh, and it's going to have a residence time value associated with it so that can give you an idea of fluid residence time in your system as you as you uh, progress uh, through your simulation so that, that's the idea basically tracers are taking the place of passive scalars yeah yeah okay um one more question just came in so let's take this one it says um can barracuda be used to simulate pipe erosion resulting from the flow of oil and sand mixture and is there any publication on this using barracuda um and i don't know if you have you had much experience with this application matt or would you like me to take this one no you, you can go ahead i don't have any experience with uh pipe okay, erosion. okay. and i know um the, so several users have done this type of modeling with Barracuda, right? Where they're modeling pipe flow and it's it's liquid inside the pipe. It's carrying uh, sand particles. And Barracuda does have an erosion model so that you can um, get results that show you where erosion is most likely to happen. Uh, you can compare multiple cases to see if one case would experience less erosion than another case. So um there, there is some really useful information you can get from that model i believe we do have a few publications on this that that our users have written um so uh, i will reach out to the person who asked this question and and share links to those publications uh, because i know people have had experience doing that with the software um okay i think that covers all the questions that have come in so far and so um We'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar at this point. So I want to just uh, thank everyone who's attended and uh, thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, we we hope you enjoy this version 23 release and we always uh, welcome your feedback. Uh, let us know if you have feature requests or ideas about uh, making Barracuda better. Um, so thank you all for attending. And that concludes this webinar. <laughs>